I remain two days at Los Angeles in this painful state of mind. I contemplated the lake. The waters were placid. All around was calm. And the snowy mountains, the palaces of nature, were not changed. By degrees, the calm and heavenly scene restored me. I continued my journey towards Geneva. The road ran by the side of the lake, which became narrower as I approached my native town. I discovered more distinctly the black sides of Jura and the brighter summit of Mont Blanc. I wept like a child. Dear mountains, my own beautiful lake, how do you welcome your wanderer? Your summits are clear, the skies and lake are blue and placid. Is this to prognosticate peace, or to mock me at my unhappiness? I fear, my friend, that I shall render myself tedious by dwelling on these preliminary circumstances, but there were days of comparative happiness, and I think on them with pleasure. My country, my beloved country, who but a native can tell the delight I took in again beholding thy streams, thy mountains, and more than all, thy lovely lake? Yet as I drew nearer home, grief and fear overcame me. Night also closed around, and while I could hardly see the dark mountains, I felt still more gloomily. The picture appeared a vast and dim scene of evil, and I foresaw obscurely that I was destined to become the most wretched of human beings. Alas, I prophesied truly, and failed only in one circumstance, that in all the misery I imagined and dreaded, I did not conceive the hundredth part of the anguish I was destined to endure. It was completely dark when I arrived in the environs of Geneva. The gates of the town were already shut, and I was obliged to pass the night at Cetron, a village half a league to the east of the city. The sky was serene, and as I was unable to rest, I resolved to visit the spot where my poor William had been murdered. As I could not pass through the town, I was obliged to cross the lake in a boat to arrive at Plain Palais. During this short voyage, I saw lightning playing on the summit of Mont Blanc in the most beautiful figures. The storm appeared approaching rapidly, and on landing, I ascended a low hill that I might observe its progress. It advanced. The heavens were clouded, and I soon felt the rain coming slowly in large drops, but its violence quickly increased. I quitted my seat and walked on. Although the darkness and storm increased every minute, and the thunder burst with a terrific crash over my head, it was echoed from Salive, the Juras, and the Alps of Savoy. Vivid flashes of lightning dazzled my eyes, illuminating the lake, making it appear like a vast sheet of fire. Then for an er instant everything seemed of a pitchy darkness, until the eye recovered itself from the preceding flash. The storm, as is often the case in Switzerland, appeared at once in various parts of the heavens. The most violent storm hung exactly north of the town, over the part of, of the lake which lies the pr uh, promontory of Belrive and the village of Copet. Another storm enlightened Jura with faint flashes, and another darkened and sometimes disclosed the Mole, a peaked mountain to the east of the lake. While I watched the tempest, so beautiful yet terrific, I wandered on with a hasty step. This noble war in the skies elevated my spirits. I clasped my hands and exclaimed aloud, William, dear angel, this is thy funeral. This is thy dirge. As I said these words, I perceived in the gloom a figure which stole from behind a clump of trees near me. I stood, fixed, gazing intently. I could not be mistaken. A flash of lightning illuminated the object and discovered its shape plainly to me its gigantic stature, and the deformity of its aspect, more hideous than belongs to humanity, instantly informed me that it was the wretch, the filthy demon, to whom I had given life. What did he there? Could he be, I shuddered at the conception, the murderer of my brother.